Hey, praise the Lord. It is I, Brother Clinton, once again. Welcome back to the Word Prophet Channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that in the last days, the world would be covered in gross darkness. Covered in gross darkness. And indeed, it is, even today. The world is covered in gross darkness. And the darkness has power. Which is why the Bible says, of those of us who are saints, that Jesus Christ our Lord hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. It's written in the first chapter of Colossians. And a lot of what makes the difference between the darkness and the light is words. Words are units of communication. Words are things that we use to communicate with one another, whether we're speaking in English or in French or Spanish or German or Chinese or whatever language we might be speaking. Words are units of communication, and they can communicate truth or they can communicate error. And so we know by the Scripture and by the Holy Ghost the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. But the Word of God is spirit and life. And the Bible says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word of God is like uh, silver purified in a furnace seven times. It is true, it is pure, it is holy, it is light, it is life. And in him there is no darkness at all. However, the, the power of this world or the powers of this world use words to deceive. And the Bible says that even Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So how much more if his ministers shall be transformed into ministers of righteousness. See, it's not a marvelous thing that Satan's ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness, which clearly means that Satan's ministers profess themselves to be Christians. They say that they're disciples of Christ, and they come forth with words that are not words from God. They're words of darkness. And the only way that we're going to know the difference is to abide in the light, which is why Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, Jesus didn't say, if ye continue going to church. He said, if ye continue in my word. Praise the Lord. The unfortunate reality is that most people that profess to be Christians in this world spend more time going to church than they spend reading God's word. And that is a fatal error, which will not end well for them. But those of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ, we're his disciples because we abide in his word. We read his word and we do what he says. Therefore, we're his disciples. Praise the Lord. And we are able to discern the difference by the grace of God between the light and the darkness. And that's what I want to talk to you about in this video. I'm making this video because, uh, primarily because of one of you who wrote to me yesterday. But this very thing that you wrote to me about, you know who you are, sister. May God bless you. Um, has been written to me about many times. And so it's come to the point where I've decided, like I have many times and many occasions, to make a public video so that in the future when someone writes to me about this, I can refer them to this video, which may be the reason that you're watching this video, because maybe you wrote to me about this particular thing. And this particular thing is, it's a question, is it okay or is it not okay to say the word amen? A-M-E-N, amen. Is it okay or is it not okay to say the word amen? Well, the word amen is written all throughout the scripture. It's written scores of times in the scripture. Jesus said amen when he was teaching his disciples how to pray. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he taught them that, that prayer, which we call the Lord's Prayer. Um, and, you know, when he ended the prayer, he said, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So our Lord Jesus Christ said amen. David the prophet said amen when, when he wrote many of the Psalms. The word Amen is written all throughout the Old and New Testaments. Uh, it is a Hebrew word that means, so be it, or so let it be, or verily. Um, and, of course, verily is an English word that most people are not familiar with, but verily means truly. Okay, So that's what the word Amen means, or some people pronounce it Amen, because that's how you uh, say it in Hebrew, I think. I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, and I don't speak Hebrew. I speak English and Spanish. So, um, but some people say amen, and I say it that way as well, amen, uh, a lot of times when I'm praying. But it doesn't really make any difference how you pronounce it, it's still the same word. Uh, but there are some people who have been 
convinced to think that it's not okay to say amen. And the reason that they have been convinced to think that is because of agents of the serpent who have come to them twisting around words in foreign languages to cause them to think that words in English mean the same thing as words or parts of words in other languages. And what I mean by that is, and I'm not an expert on this, and I don't really need to be, but um, from what I understand, people will come to you if you're a young disciple, and they'll tell you that actually when you say amen, you're actually praising an, an Egyptian god called Amon or something like that. Amon or Amun, I don't know, um, something like that. It doesn't really matter and for reasons that I'll explain to you very clearly in a moment. But they convince these people that they convince young tender disciples that when they say the word amen they're actually praising a different god that's called something like amun or aman or something like that that's supposedly an ancient egyptian god which would be in reality one of the fallen angels or the offspring of one of the fallen angels um, they are the gods the, the gods that the people of this world worship the gods that the catholics and protestants and the buddhists and the the, the mormons and the jehovah's witnesses and the islamists are those gods they're the gods of those religions, the fallen angels and the offspring of the fallen angels. And so the, these people, they come to them and they say, well, something like this. They say, well, in, in the Arabic language or in the Egyptian language, you have this word aman. And this word aman in this foreign language means a, a, a god of the Egyptians. And so when you say amen, you're saying a form of the word aman, which means you're worshiping uh, a, a, a false god, a god of the Egyptians. And those who are young in the faith and tender, the, if the person is kind of, sounds like he knows what he's talking about when he explains this to them, they will believe this, and then they'll be afraid to say the word amen. But let's just hang on a second, because the Bible says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And so the first question that we should ask ourselves is, is God really going to put a word in the scripture that, we shouldn't say because if we say it, we're worshiping another God. Is God really going to do that? I mean, the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So if God has said that, and God said by the mouth of his son Jesus Christ that till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all things be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17, I believe that's where it is. Then how is it that God, the almighty God who made the heavens and the earth, who knows the hearts of all men, who knows every hair on your head, who knows how many grains of sand are on the earth, He's the one who, who, who spread forth the foundations of the earth in the first place and who spread forth the heavens as a garment and put the stars in their places and calls them all by their names. So how is it that we should think that God, this almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth who knows all things and his eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, that he put a word in the scripture that if we say that word, we're worshiping another God. When God, the almighty God, appeared to his people, Israel, in the, in the land of, of, of Arabia and Mount Sinai, he gave them ten commandments. I think we're all familiar with the ten commandments. And the first commandment was that he said, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of anything that is in the heaven or in the earth or in the, in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor worship them, for, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So why would God, the Almighty God who said those things, put a word in his word that would cause his people when we speak that word to be worshiping another god, well, the answer is, obviously, that wouldn't happen. Okay, that's the first and most obvious point of this matter. Um, it reminds me of a kind of a comedic saying, Captain Obvious, Captain Obvious, um, here's your sign. It's, it's really kind of plain. And I don't mean to make a joke about it. It's just that it's so plain that it's kind of silly to think otherwise. 
but and I'm not ridiculing those who might have gotten caught up in this. I'm just I'm making this point to cause you to see how silly it is to think otherwise. So here's the other part of this of the logic of this matter. As I said before you to you, pardon me. As I said to you earlier, I speak English and Spanish. I don't speak Hebrew. Um, I know a couple of words in German, but I don't really speak German. But I speak English and Spanish, and so I. As I was learning Spanish, I can tell you that I learned a lot about English and a lot about languages, because most people that only speak one language really don't understand the language that they're speaking, and such was the case with me. You know, I was raised all my life until I was, what, 40 years old, something like that, only learning, oh, pardon me, oh, pardon me, only speaking English. The only language I ever learned was English, and so I didn't really understand what I was speaking. I just spoke the language. I just spoke it because everybody else spoke it. I didn't understand why I was speaking the things that I was speaking. I didn't understand etymology and the principles of, you know, etymology and the construction of words and of phrases and of sentences. I didn't understand any of those things, nor did I care to, until I started to learn another language uh, back in 2000. And, and when I started to learn the Spanish language, I started to learn a lot about English, and I started to pay a lot more attention to things that I was saying. And so I can tell you this. There are words that are spelled the same and sound the same in Spanish and in English that don't mean the same thing. They don't mean the same thing at all. And they don't have any obligation to mean the same thing because they're different languages. Like, for instance, um, the word mes. Okay? Mes in Spanish, M-E-S, means month. Okay? It can also be used in the sense of a woman's monthly cycle. But that aside, let's just use it right now for the word month, okay? But in English, the word mess, if you spell it with two S's, is a, a place that's very disorganized. Like I could have stuff all over my desk all mixed up and messed around and it would be a mess, okay? M-E-S-S, -S, mess. Well, in Spanish, the word M-E-S, mess, which is pronounced that way, mess, it's not really mess, it's more like mess, but it's pronounced pretty much the same way, and it's spelled pretty much the same way, but it's a totally different word. So if I'm speaking Spanish, and I say we're in the month of November, estamos en el mes noviembre, I'm not saying that the month of November is a mess. I'm not saying that. See, so But someone that doesn't understand the language, someone who only speaks Spanish, somebody might come to them and say, well, did you know that in English the word mess means disorder? You know, something that's disorganized? And try to convince a person that's speaking Spanish that when they're talking about the month of November, they're actually saying that the month of November is all messy. And if, if that person is, is skilled in deceiving, he might cause that Spanish-speaking person to think that because the word mess in English means what it means in English, that it has to be transposed into the Spanish language. The meaning of it has to be carried over into the Spanish language because that's what it means in English, which is kind of stupid because it doesn't mean that in Spanish. The word mess means something in English and it means a different thing in Spanish. The fact that it means one thing in English doesn't mean that it has to mean that in the Spanish language when it's the same word because it's not the same word. It's spelled the same almost and it's pronounced the same almost but it's not the same word, okay? Let's talk about the word sin, okay? And this is a more perfect example because the word sin in English, S-I-N, and the word sin in Spanish, S-I-N, they're spelled exactly the same way, but they're not the same word. The word sin in English, according to 1 John 3, 4, means the transgression of the law. A sin is the transgression of the law. If you're speaking English, that's what it means. If you're speaking Spanish, it's pronounced a little different because of the letter I. So it's pronounced sin instead of sin. It's pronounced sin, but the word sin in Spanish doesn't mean the transgression of the law. It means without. The word sin means without. Like if I were to order a hamburger without cheese, or a cheeseburger without cheese, or let's just say it a different way, a cheeseburger without onions. You know, give me a cheeseburger with no onions, please. Okay, so in Spanish, I would say, dame una hamburguesa con queso, pero sin cebolla, por favor. Sin cebolla, without onions. Okay, now if I'm, if I'm ordering a hamburger without onions in Spanish, and I only speak Spanish, 
and somebody comes to me and sits down next to me and starts to explain to me that the word sin in English actually means the transgression of the law. So I shouldn't say sin cebolla. I shouldn't say that because it doesn't really mean without onions. It means that having a hamburger without onions is a transgression of the law. And so if this man was very adept in the art of lying, he could convince me that for me to order a hamburger without onions in Spanish is actually a transgression of the law, that I have to have onions with my hamburger, otherwise I'm transgressing the law. And that's kind of stupid also, isn't it? But that's the same kind of logic that people use, these, these agents of the serpent, when they come to you and they try to teach you that because there's some god named Amon, that's a, a god of the Egyptians, that we shouldn't say the word Amen because it's a form of the same word and it means the same thing. But it's not. Because the Egyptians don't speak Hebrew. And Amen is a Hebrew word. Okay? Amen, I might add this too. Amen is a Spanish word also. It's a, it's a subjunctive plural, it's a plural subjunctive form of the word Amar, which means to love. Okay? So I might say, you know, I'm, I'm telling you all that you need to love me. Estoy diciendo a todos ustedes que me, que, que me amen. Amen. Que me amen. That you love me. Okay? That's a Spanish word. It doesn't mean amen. And it doesn't mean aman, an Egyptian god. It means to love me. Me amen. You see, it's a different language. So even though it's spelled the same way, and it might be pronounced the same way or very similar to the same way, it's not the same word because it's a different language. And, it, and, and whatever it means in another language is completely irrelevant to the meaning of the language that it has in the language that I'm speaking. Pardon me, to the meaning that it has in the language that I'm speaking. So the fact that Aman might be an Egyptian deity and Amen is a Spanish word that means I'm telling you that you need to love me. I'm telling you to love me. Me que me amen. You know, it's a plural subjunctive form. So I'm speaking to a group of people and I'm saying que me amen. You should love me. You need to love me. Que me amen. Amen. Okay, that's a Spanish word. It's not the same as the Hebrew word amen. It's spelled the same and it's pronounced the same, but it's not the same word. So for someone to come to me and tell me that a word that I'm speaking in English has to mean the same thing as a, as a similar word that's spelled a similar way in a different language, that's ridiculous. That just doesn't make any sense at all. And unfortunately for those who are young in the faith, and I'm not degrading you and, and saying that you're dumb or anything because you're not, it's just that if you're young in the faith and you haven't been in the Word of God very long, it's easy for deceivers like this to come in unto you and to deceive you with these things, whether they're sitting next to you on a park bench or whether they're speaking in a YouTube video and you're wasting your time surfing YouTube when you shouldn't be and drinking in in your eyes and your ears things that you shouldn't be. And that's easy to fall into. Many of us have fallen into it. I'd be lying if I said I'd never fallen into it in time past. Okay, it's an easy thing to fall into. But we need to be very careful of these things and we need to do what Jesus commanded which is continue in his word. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so if you do that and you know the truth and you're Jesus' disciple, and then someone comes to you and they says, you know, you shouldn't say amen because it's a form of the Egyptian word aman, which is a, 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 an Egyptian deity. It's a devil. So when you say amen, you're worshiping devils. Well, if I'm in the Word of God and I'm Jesus' disciple and I know the truth, then I'm going to know immediately that that's not true. But there are some of us who are young in the faith who are more easily overtaken by such things, and that's the reason that I'm making this video message, so that you can understand how ridiculous it is, how silly it is for someone to come to you and tell you that a word that you're speaking in English that is written in the Holy Bible scores of times is a word that you shouldn't say because there's a word in a foreign language that's spelled almost the same way and it means something completely different in that other language. It means something bad in that other language. So it's, they say it's got to mean something bad when we say it in English. That's just silly. That just doesn't make any sense at all if you really think about it, right? So praise the Lord. May this message be a blessing to those of you who might have been thinking about this or might have been um, 
um, exposed to some teaching like this. And if, I'm, if I've sent you this video because of a letter that you sent me, I hope that this has sufficiently answered your question and strengthened you in our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I'm going to say it again, like for the third or fourth time in this video, Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So let's do that. Let's continue in his word, because that's where the life is. That's where the light is. That's where the revelation is. And that's how we're going to enter into the kingdom. Because when God put Adam out of the garden, when Adam had sinned against the Lord, he and his wife had sinned against the Lord, and God put him out of the garden for one reason and one reason only, because he didn't want, because God did not want Adam to partake of the tree of life while he was in his sin. And so God put Adam out of the garden, and he put on the east of the garden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way. And that flaming sword which turned every way is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And there's only one way back into paradise. There's only one way back into the garden that God kicked Adam out of. And that is by the Word of God. And that is why when God came in the flesh, His Word was manifest in His Son, Jesus Christ. The Word of God is in the Son of God. And Jesus Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is that tree of life. And the only way back into the garden to be a partaker of the tree of life is through this word. And therefore it is written in Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, right almost at the end of the whole Bible. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and that they may enter in through the gates into the city. They that do his commandments are obviously the ones who have read his word so they know what his commandments are. Many people write to me and they say, how do I know what the will of God is? Here's how you know. Abide in his word. Praise the Lord. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen.